Morning, everybody. I think we should probably get going. Um, so this week's guest is going to be Ross Driver, who's uh, one of the managers of Foresight Solar Fund. And obviously, I think it's going to be quite interesting to hear his take on what's been going on uh, with that market over the past few weeks. Um, and I've been sort of, with the, this week's news, sort of alluding to some of that, because two of the things that I pulled out from what happened this week were Hicklin Church's new NAV announcement, which um, talks about this, like, discount rates, which will be quite pertinent. Um, and also Daniel Newables, because they put out a statement um, trying to give some of the context as to how they might be affected by any kind of potential price cap imposed by the UK government. Um, so we'll come up with that now. Um, Hickel Infrastructure, uh, as you probably know, has, has traded a fairly sizable premium for, for most of its life. Um, there are a couple of occasions when it hasn't. There's the obvious market panic in 2020 when a lot of funds suddenly dived out to a discount and then rebounded again. There's another much bigger chunk here in 2018. That relates in part to um, what happened around the Labour Party conference um, when they talked about renationalising infrastructure. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, and then obviously what's been going on the last few weeks, and that's mainly around discount rates, but there are other factors as well, I think as well. So discount's not huge. Um, it's not that serious. You can see it here, it's about four and a half percent, which um, within the context of this peer group um, is still relatively narrow. We have seen some big spikes out in the digital infrastructure funds. Um, and we might, I remember we did talk to some of these before, I think we might try and get some of them back on the show again to talk about what's been going on with those funds recently, because I'm not sure there's any good reason why those, those discounts have spiked out quite as far as they have. But there we go. And um, obviously, HECOL is still the biggest of these funds. Um, still offers a very attractive yield, still a reasonable sort of going charges ratio. Here's the returns. Um, it's kind of middle ranking, um, which I suppose... Um, is, is okay, but it's, it's sort of a steady eddy fund. That's what it's been trying to do. And actually with 10 year returns of nine hops a year are pretty good, even though things have been slightly lower more recently. But in price terms, because of this discount widening, um, it has been a bit lower more recently. So this is where it's invested. So it's still got the bulk of its money invested in the UK, even though you've seen it do a lot of fairly high profile deals outside of the UK. It's still 73%, so it's quite pertinent what happens within the UK economy. Um, and two thirds of its investments are still the kind of PPP, PFI type projects um, that, that most of these things were launched to invest in. It has got a fair chunk now of assets where the returns are based on demand rather than availability. These, these, these are more sort of availability assets. These are more linked to um, throughput, which may be things like um, road traffic, for example. And then it's also got some regulated asset exposure, um, which you see here, these are the 10 largest investments. And the largest one is Affinity Water, which is obviously a regulated asset. And then you've got things like the roads here in uh, US and France. Um, and then you've got the sort of traditional kind of things, but you also got things like High Speed 1, 2, which is the Channel Tunnel Rail Link between St Pancras and uh, the coast. So um, at the end of September, the NEV um, actually went up, and I think that might have surprised some people. Uh, underneath the uh, hood, the operational performance has been sort of in line with expectations. So the, the big drivers are, are things that they mention here, inflation, uh, rising interest rates, the effect of sterling exchange rates, um, and obviously bond yields. Um, the discount rate, which is the thing that everybody's been worried about, which is what has been making these discounts spike out, um, actually only went up by about half a percent. So it's, got, it's gone up, which drives down the NEV, but, but not enormously um, and you can see it here broken down properly so um, that was the NEV as of the 31st of March 5p added for the normal operating turn that's what you expect the effect of inflation that's another 4p and that's actual inflation during the period um, the weakness of sterling adds about 2p then you've got 
the effect of forecast inflation being higher, there's another 2p. The higher discount rate takes off about 9p. So um, basically that the effect would have been bigger were it not for these compensating factors. Um, and then higher interest rates all washed through into an additional penny per share. Um, dividends come off that, and you get the closing NEV of 164.3p. This is what um, has been driving the fear about discount rates. So these are the 30-year bonds in the UK, which is the white line, US and Germany, which is the green one. And obviously they've all spiked up in uh, the past um, couple of months. Um, it's interesting, I think, from this to see that for a long time, the US 30-year bond rates have been way above where, where, where we are in the UK. And we'll, we've just sort of caught them up and surpassed it, um, which slightly plays this narrative that it's not just about what's going on in the UK politics. But of course, part of it definitely is that. It also plays the narrative that actually that the Federal Reserve go on the case of, of trying to sort things out a bit more aggressively than we did. Um, and I think that that's what lifted up their, their interest rates, which wants to interest rates a bit. But uh, that spike in bond yields um, actually just takes us back to where we were in 2013-14, which is um, when a lot of these big infrastructure funds were being listed. Um, so, um, if you saw that I wrote some things recently, um, basically just saying that looking at Hickel in particular, and actually its discount rate has not moved very far one way or the other all the way through that, despite what's happened with, with certain bond yields. Um, so there is no linear relationship between these bond yields and the discount rates. Um, so I said half percent added in there against a 2% increase in the 30-year bond yield over the six-month period. The other two moved up more slowly. Um, inflation, they're talking about going from 6% uh, to 10% for the next um, six months, um, and then still higher than they were forecasting, but, but down to about 5% for the following 12 months. And then it starts to fall away and the much lower inflation in the US and Europe, um, but still higher than they were otherwise forecasting back in March. Um, so all of that has an impact on the discount rates, all that has an impact on is NAV. I think there's a, a bigger question mark over infrastructure though that we need to start thinking about now, which is obviously Although the consensus are resisting the idea of an election as, as hard as they can, um, that might become overwhelming at some point, and therefore it becomes quite relevant as to what Labour Party would do. And so if you go back to uh, 2019, there was a general worry because uh, then when the party was led by Corbyn, they said they were going to renationalise all these private finance contracts. Um, which obviously would have had quite a big impact. And there was a question mark as to what sort of level they, they'd be paying for them. Um, we have seen, the basically the problem we've got with the Labour Party, and I think that's just a general thing, is that they, they're quite light on policy detail. So we just don't know what they're going to do. Um, the only thing that seems to be certain is that they're going to gradually renationalise the rail contracts that shouldn't, I think, have much of an impact on Hickel, because the, although it's got that high speed one line there, they've kissed on and said basically they're only going to nationalise rail only as the contracts expire. It could mean though, because um, there's a sort of ongoing um, dispute between Eurostar as the main user of the high speed one and the owners of it about what uh, Eurostar should be paying for it, given that Eurostar's traffic has um, been driven down by Brexit. That, um, the government won't stand in on um, Hickel sides or high speed one side when it comes to um, arguing the case for whether you're still going to afford to pay for the line or not. Um, so there's a, maybe a slight question mark over that. There's a there's a wider thing that they're talking about doing with this is GV energy thing. Um, whether that work turns into a sort of wider national infrastructure bank type idea, we don't know yet. They have talked about <coughs> renationalizing Royal Mail, but that, even though the conference wants to do that, I don't think that's actually official party policy. So 
but it's a sort of big question mark, I think. And that means that there may be um, a lower premium for these assets than there has been. Um, but I still don't think there's any good reason why they should be trading at big discounts. Um, so the, we, we said the discount rate thing seems to be manageable. Inflation is obviously helping them. Higher interest rates are helping them. It doesn't really matter that the corporation tax didn't get cut in the end uh, because they, they were kind of used to the idea that it was going from 2019 to 25. So that the, the reverse of a policy didn't make much difference. Um, I do think that they're, they're set reasonably well. It doesn't have any renewables exposure to answer a question here. Um, and I've talked about labour. Um, and then we'll come on to the other one. Downing then. Um, we've got here uh, a chart of it um, over the past uh, 12 months or so. And it has not tended to trade as a premium as much as many of its other renewable energy um, counterparts. And I've always thought that's a bit unfair because it's actually been doing quite well, as you can see from the NAV progression. Um, and more recently, it's had quite a widening its discount. And a lot of these discounts widened out. And it's good. Part of it is this, the discount rate thing. And part of it is this idea now about windfall taxes and price caps and things. Um, so, they aren't as exposed to the UK as some other renewable energy companies, including Foresight, we're going to talk to in a minute. Um, so 32% on sort of mainland UK and 10% um, in Northern Ireland. Um, and then a big chunk of exposure to Sweden, which is obviously part of the EU. Um, and <coughs> The question mark over price caps um, has um, caused them to sort of think about what they could do to stay, to try and stabilise their share price. So they just thought, well, what we'll do is we will um, announce a bit more information about where our um, income is coming from. So they're giving us some breakdowns of this. So. The UK, as I said, is, is falling in terms of the importance within the, um, the group as a whole. So it goes down, drops down to about 46% from 26 to 13 and 35. And as they invest more money, they seem to be investing more of it overseas. So I think that will continue to fall. Um, and sales of power in the open market aren't very important at all. So um, I need about 9% of their revenue. Most of their revenue comes from subsidies. Um, and here is the revenue mix between uh, inflation linked subsidy type income, other sorts of fixed revenue, because they sell um, power under private wire arrangements um, and also uh, some, some power purchase agreements. And then this is the sort of spot power price stuff. Um, which gets a bit bigger over time because they have the these things to be fixed um, and then roll off. But um, nevertheless, it's still not a huge chunk. And you can see here over the long term that that's, that's the great part. That's the merchant power price stuff. Um, and then the subsidy income eventually falls away because they, those all have sort of fixed lives. This is what they are forecasting in terms of power prices in the UK. Um, and so obviously much higher prices at the moment, but um, those are well below the current rates of power prices. Um, and then falling down to, this is there about 76 pounds a megawatt for 2035. These are June 22 prices. It, confuses everybody but the, the, you have to look at them in terms of like um, you have to check the, the context of these things obviously real power prices are a lot higher than this at the moment um, but the price cap levels that we talked about we talked about much lower even than this and so therefore there might be a, a hole there um, as I say this is what's really going on with power prices so I think it's important to, to think when, when these things were making uh, their investments or, or, or thinking about coming to market, these are the power prices that they were kind of expecting. So, so this is what we're factoring into the models. And 
I would think they would be comfortable with, with the prices in this sort of area. But at the moment, they're up here. Um, and I think Ross is probably best place to talk about whether, you know, what the rights of the will be for price cap. But the government has given no indication yet, and that's part of the problem we have. In Sweden, um, it's a different situation. Um, obviously, they're, they're dealing with a price cap that has been imposed by the EU, and that's set at 180 euros a megawatt. So they're way, way above the prices that um, they've actually been assuming. Um, there are different lines there to explain what the difference between SE2, SE3 is, um, to ask the questions on here. Um, Sweden's divided up on a regional basis as to into different power markets, and um, they're almost sort of standalone things, but they're building more and more interconnectors between them so that um, they can generate power in the north of the country and then transmit it down to the south where it's needed. But at the moment, there's almost too much power in the north and not enough in the south, and so prices are higher in the south than they are in the north. That's just the way it works. And because the south now has now got interconnectors with Germany, where power prices are much higher still, um, that, that means that, that that's dragging up the prices in the, um, the southern region, the, the SE4 region. Um, but nevertheless, these things are relatively stable there. And they're well below the EU price cap. I don't think, well, I think what the point of all of this is that Dora is saying, that even with the price cap that's present in the EU, that's not going to make much of a difference to its, uh, to, to its business. If UK price caps are also set at a sensible level, so well below the current prices, but still um, well above what they've been assuming, it doesn't really matter. Um, well, but we just have to wait and see what the UK level is going to be because we just don't know. So that's enough from me. And now we'll